I'll give you a quick tour of me, quick tour of NEA, and then talk a bit about the topic, which is, you know, are you ready for U.S. venture capital, which basically boils down to what does U.S. venture capital look for in a company? A pretty rare group. Um, and I want to leave as much time as possible for questions. So you know, give me like 15 minutes out of the 40, 20 minutes, but then let's get as much interactivity as we can. I will answer almost any question. I'm probably one of the most filterless venture folks out there. So feel free to ask anything you want. And if I can't answer it, I'll tell you I can't. All right, so I was an entrepreneur for 25 years, ran companies all through high school and college, and started one of the first e-commerce companies in the world in 1993, pretty early. Berners-Lee, you know, thank you to the European Union for actually creating the web and, and all the wonder that it brought. Created WWW in sort of late 92, early 93, and I thought it was gonna change the world, so I started an e-commerce site. Took that company public six years later. The world blew up in the bursting of the bubble, and I then took that company private. By the way, just in case you're wondering, there will be no slides. I am a pure talking head, so you won't have any distractions. Um, so took that company public, took it private, and then moved to the West Coast. I was uh, mainly on the East Coast, New York City, and spent about 10 years as an institutional seed investor. So over about a decade, and this is highly relevant to sort of why my points of view may or may not be useful to you. Over 10 years, I funded about 80 companies as a seed investor. I was usually in that very first capital round. In the old days, a seed round was 500,000 to a million dollars, then it grew to a million and a half, then it grew to three. Um, of those companies, more than half raised Series A venture capital from tier one firms. Uh, often with my introductions, I was involved in, I'm pretty sure, 100% of those rounds. I always made introductions in a very narrow band. What I would say to my entrepreneurs is, if you are ready to raise Series A, in my view, I will introduce you to the two perfect people. And if you're not, I won't introduce you to anybody. If I introduce you to two perfect people and they both pass for a legitimate reason, I'll introduce you to two more, and that's the limit of it. Because it took me about eight years to build my network. That network was precisely 323 VCs of the top 15 firms in the world. The reason I know that number is the firm I was running an institutional practice for doing equity investing was actually a large venture debt shop, and they cared more about my network than they cared about the returns. So I kept a very detailed list of the people I got to know, and I'd invite them around for wine once every quarter or so, and got to know a lot of great people. By the way, out of that 323 people, I strongly dislike three. That's a pretty good statement. I mean, I'm at least neutral on most of them, and there's a lot of great people there. Venture is a really interesting business where you've got smart, successful, well-achieved people that probably don't have to work that choose to. Now, some of those people can be quite arrogant, but it's pretty rare. Usually that's a false facade. Usually they all want the same thing. They want to get involved in truly exciting companies. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur for 25 years, but now I just live vicariously through other entrepreneurs. But when I'm talking about sort of this network of 323 VCs that I developed over 10 years, I spent a lot of time asking them what they wanted to see, what they needed, what they wanted in terms of rounds. Because when I made an introduction, I wanted to make sure that it was the right introduction. In eight years of making introductions, I had two people say no. And they were, one of them was wrong to say no, and the other one I'm fine with. So that's pretty good, because I made a lot of introductions. So I got a really good feeling for what they wanted. Flash forward, I ended up becoming a general partner of a small firm for about two years, and I joined NEA about a year and a half ago. Now, before that, I spent about 10 years doing deals with NEA. When I said I'd introduce people to one of two of the right folks, NEA was almost always on that list. And the reason it's just a firm that really resonated for me and for what I wanted for my entrepreneurs. Very founder supportive, a uh, bunch of smart folks, really hard, no ego at all. I'm probably literally the most outspoken person that's a little more braggadocious than anybody else there. You can have, we've literally got a Nobel Prize winner on the team and you know, if he introduces himself, he'll just say, hi, I, I do some science. I mean, it's really just an understated group of folks but a lot of deep expertise and a real commitment to long term. I mean, we're in companies, I was helping a company raise money that it's year 17 of right now. Uh, they're building a, the first functioning nuclear fusion plant in the United States, so that thing takes a while. We just had a company called Bloom Energy go public. That was a 16 year journey. It's not common for venture capitalists to stick it out for that long. All right, so NEA, without SoftBank, world's largest venture firm, 20 billion of committed capital, current fund is about $3.3 billion. So let's now move forward to what does VC want and need, and I'm gonna use that as an example. So the size of a fund tremendously impacts what a fund is going to be able or willing to invest in. How many people here feel comfortable they know what they need to know about venture economics? Okay, so I will, that's the very, very tall, small percentage, so I'm gonna walk through it. Venture economics are pretty straightforward. You get fee and you get carry. NEA actually gives the fees back. So the way venture capitalists make money 
is to make a percentage of the upside in any deal they invest in once they have, and this is the critical thing, returned the fund. So venture capitalists go out and raise money from LPs, limited partners. They give them a certain amount of capital. Let's just call it a dollar. And once the VC gives back that dollar, they get nothing for giving back the dollar. But on the second dollar, they get to keep 20 to 30%. So for a venture capitalist that really wants to achieve something, they have to return the fund. And then it starts to get exciting. The fees pay a perfectly good living. I'm not complaining about the way I live my life. It's just that to do anything material, you have to have that outcome. And so you want to believe that any investment you make, any investment you make, has at least some chance of returning the fund, or in a fund the size of NEAs, to at least be material to it. Now, everybody has a different view of what material is. In my view, material for a $3.3 billion fund is an outcome that if everything goes right, people work incredibly hard, get lucky. Luck is the combination of hard work and opportunity. Luck isn't lazy sitting around hoping it all rains down on you. But luck is required. Luck is timing. Luck is location. Luck is idea. Luck is all kinds of things. I want to believe there's a multi-billion dollar opportunity at the end of the rainbow. Here's my progression of thinking about what venture means. I used to think, well, it has to be at least a billion dollar opportunity. Then I started to say, you know what, that's not big enough. It has to be billions. And then I th started realizing, you know, maybe that's not big enough either. I think it needs to be unbounded upside. Now, I will admit that my view is particularly exaggerated because when I spent all that time talking to those 323 VCs, the ones that I found that had the biggest successes and that were the most impressive to me were the ones that had the most outsized vision of what they wanted to do. At least one of them fits in that list of three, by the way, that I don't actually like. And, but I remember these lessons. I'll give you a quick story as an example of this. I was in the office of a very famous venture firm partner that had done pretty well there over time, but eventually got pushed out of the firm, interestingly enough, and he said, Ben, you know how people in Silicon Valley brag about their 10x returns? Brag about sometimes their 100x returns? He said, you know what? We don't give a blank about those. We care about an opportunity for 1,000x returns. And we've had four. And I remember thinking, dude, there's a big ego on this guy. And that's nice to hear, but where's yours? Right? Like, you don't have a 1,000x return, right? And he hadn't had one. But right behind him on the wall were a list of all the companies he'd invested in. And one of them was LinkedIn. And I'm pretty sure if they held their shares, that on their very first investment there at 8 or 10 or 12, or whatever the valuation was, that they made their 1,000x return. Interestingly, it didn't make it in time, and he is now somewhere else, because firms are generally various levels of um, I, one of our partners was, had interviewed a bunch of firms and this particular firm came up where he had talked and we said, well, how do they describe themselves? We describe ourselves as a family. It's a lot of joint support. It's a team effort. Everybody has a co-sponsor. He said, yeah, they were a little different. They said it's the Hunger Games, if you know that movie, right? Everybody kills everybody else until one person's standing. So that's the range of what venture capital is like, Hunger Games to communal family. It's one of the reasons I love NEA so much. We're very much a communal family. So what does venture need? Well, it needs to return the fund. And therefore, your business has to have the promise to achieve that. Because we'll be wrong a lot. But when we're right, think about it this way. I use this analogy a lot. Imagine that we're in primitive times and we live in a cave. It's me and my family. And my family's getting ready to go through the winter. Snows are piling up. I'm the lone hunter, I'm down to my last arrow, and I'm now out there hunting for game. If I shoot a squirrel perfectly through the heart, my family dies. But if I shoot a bison and hit it, my family lives. Now, if I miss either creature, my family dies too. The point is, nobody in venture should be shooting at squirrels. Nobody gets any benefit from what is considered, and this, this comes off sometimes poorly, a small outcome. And this is really important to understand because, you know, I was an entrepreneur a lot longer than I was a VC. And I will always be an entrepreneur. And my number one allegiance is to my founders. My ranking is family, founders, firm. And I'll, I will tell you that sometimes my founders went out over my family. You know, if the weekend comes and founders need time, I do insist they come to my house, but they get the time. I mean, you know, if it's my daughter's play or something, I'm not going to say, no, I'm going to drop out of that. But I mean, I took a meeting on Christmas Eve Eve and another one on Christmas Eve morning. You know, I'm sure the family was sort of okay with that. And then I'm sitting there doing texts while they're unwrapping presents. So, you know, I, I admit that I probably spend a little bit too much time obsessing about my founders. But 
think about that life that a founder leads, right? I assume the majority of people here that are founders are how much of this audience? Okay, most of it, that would make sense based on the topic. I don't think any European VCs, oh, I guess maybe European VCs wanna hear what I think about American venture. So your life is incredibly hard, right? If you haven't figured that out yet, be prepared. There's no such thing as an overnight success. It usually takes many years. It's incredibly difficult, it's painful. You get to stare into the valley of death. I've lived through this. We came you know, that close to bankruptcy at least twice before I got my company public. I raised no money before I signed the underwriter's letter except my own. Right? Like it's a really, really hard and lonely life. No matter who's there to support you, your investors will be there to help you. But let's face it, the best investors in the world will be there one or two percent of the time. The other 98, 99 percent of the time is yours. So those 2 a.m., you know, horrible, worrisome things about whether this critical thing is going to happen, you're going to go through all of that. So why do I emphasize that? Well, you're going to suffer an enormous amount of pain to get to your opportunity for success. I would encourage you to make sure that your understanding of what success is matches your investors. I'll use a specific example. Let's say, oh, here's a really specific example. I won't name the company, it's not fair to them, but there were two great women, uh, East and West Coast, founders of this really interesting sort of new social network of sorts years ago, and I met with them and I thought it was a really interesting business. The growth was tremendous of users, there was no revenue, that was okay, and they wanted to raise money. And I said, you know, I wouldn't raise money for this. Your growth is exceptional. You're in a niche that I think people care about. I don't think it can be huge, but I think you'll get multiple offers to be bought in the next couple of years. And maybe those offers will be $20 million. But you know what? Two, three years of work and you're getting $20 million between the two of you with no outside investors or only 20% sold off seems pretty good to me. And then I went away. And about four months later, I was at a conference and one of the women comes running over, Ben, you remember how you said we'd never raise venture capital? And I was like, well, I think I said you shouldn't raise venture capital. We got a term sheet. Oh, okay. Now, I was surprised. I didn't think they ever would raise venture capital, but I tried not to say it that way. Who'd you get this term sheet from? By the way, there's a trick here that I'll give you. And they said, Bob from Firm X. Obviously, these are fake names. I said, that's interesting. I know Bob. Bob's a friend of mine. Bob's retired from Microsoft stay-at-home dad who works out with me when we do CrossFit. Like, he's not a VC, how could he give you a term sheet? Oh, no, 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 Bob is the newest partner at Firm X. If you have a business which should not raise venture capital and you choose to try to do so anyway and no one's giving you any money, go to the new partner. The new partner will make more mistakes because they haven't made those mistakes yet. Sometimes, by the way, mistakes aren't mistakes anymore. Sometimes it's just I have too many arrows in my back you know, it's just eventually someone breaks through. But they'll also get a lot of leeway from the partners around them because their partners don't want them to be dispirited. So if that partner's willing to fall in love and fight for this thing, and they're one of my partners, I'm probably gonna say, you know what? You're my partner. I wanna support you. And then I'm thinking, I'm gonna support you losing all our money so that you can learn a lesson so we can go on to do better things later. Go for it. Well, that's what happened here. Um, to give you the end of the story, but I, they said, what do you think? And I said, well, I don't know if you'll listen to this advice, but I think you should go to that partner and ask him, what does he need to achieve? Said, what do you mean? What does he need in the end? What does success mean to him? I know she didn't ask that question because about a year and a half later, I was working out with that same guy and I said, hey, how'd it go with company X? <coughs> oh, oh, well, it was terrible. It's like, why, what happened? Well. The founder came to me and she said she got an offer to buy the company from company XYZ for $20 million. What a surprise. Um, and I said, oh, yeah, that's bad, right? He's like, yeah. I said, what do you think I'm in this for? I mean, we put in $8 million, you know, let's call it, God knows what, a $24 million valuation. What, what, what am I going to achieve by getting my $8 million back? That's a terrible deal. I said, so what did you do? And this is a classic construct that happens. And this is, I tell this story because I want you to understand the challenge you might get into if you choose to take capital when it really doesn't fit your long-term vision of success. So here this entrepreneur decides that 20 million is success. The venture capitalist does not agree. He thinks about the following decision. I have two choices. I can either fire the CEO and replace them with somebody that will think bigger and grow me the company that I invested in the first place, or I can just let it be. Now, it can go either way. But here's the problem when it doesn't go the way you think would be right. 
Well, so you think it would be terrible to get fired, and yeah, it, it certainly would. I would have been fired if I had ever raised venture, by the way, and I did really well, so I'm super glad I didn't. Um, I am actually the perfect example of somebody that should never have raised venture capital, didn't, not because I didn't try, but because I failed, and had a great outcome because of it, because I was able to run the company in a certain way that I never could have. I was able to have a sub-venture outcome even though I took the company public, right? Anyway, so he said, here's what I decided to do. I decided it was too much brain damage to fire them. The company was, was sort of plateauing a little bit. The entrepreneur was scared. She wasn't going to be able to get it to work hereafter. So I went back to them with the following. I will support, because remember, when you take money from a VC, they have clauses in the contract which are totally normal. They need to be able to protect. I need to be able to protect my investment. If you tell me you're going to build me a multi-billion dollar company, I know it can go horribly wrong. I know I can lose all my money. What I can't have is a situation where all of a sudden you change your mind and it's like, yeah, sorry, we were going to do $2 billion worth of value, but we're going to give you $20 million instead. If I were ever to fund anybody in this room and you came back to me with that offer, you should not be at all surprised when I stare at you in absolute, total, abject terror and say, how could I have not been clearer that I have absolutely no interest in that and it will have no impact on my fund? What do you want me to do exactly now? Are you saying, that you, is this just your way of creating job suicide? You wanted to quit, but you'd rather have me fire you, so you just said this to me to really make me unhappy? Anyway, his answer was, I will support your deal because I have the right to veto it if you go back to the buyer and say, cash only, we get paid first, the investors, we get paid 100% of what we put in, which is the norm, you know, you get 1x liquidation preference. If you sell for 10 or 20, the first eight goes to the investor, that's a liquidation preference. So all cash, no stock, we get paid first, and here's the tricky part, no holdbacks. Like in a normal M&A deal, if you haven't done any, people will hold aside 10, 20, even 30% in an escrow account, just in case. They'll ask for representations. They'll ask for indemnification against fraud. And he said, none of those things. Cash on the barrel head, immediately, no indemnifications, no hold back, period, we get paid first. So what happened to that $20 million offer? It quickly turned into 10, eight of which went to the investor, and the entrepreneur, and this is the only thing that really bugs me about the story, because I don't think this is really fair, went back to her seed investors and asked them if they'd take less than a dollar on the dollar so that she could keep some. Which, in fairness, I think is totally unfair. The seed investors took an absolute risk, they put the money in, and now when the ship gets landed for a dollar on the dollar of invested capital, it's like, well, why don't you just take a loss? I, I know I didn't go where I was supposed to go, and where I was hoping to go, and where I told you I'd go, but why don't you take 50 cents so I can keep 50 cents? That one, a little weird. But net, net, the deal got done at 10. It would be surprising to me if the entrepreneurs got any money at all. So here's two entrepreneurs that could have had, let's call it $16 million, because they would have sold 20% of the company in the beginning in a seed round, or zero. And they got zero. So think about what your own version of success is before you think about whether venture is a good fit. Because forget about 20, 10, 20, 50, 100, all of those numbers are no in a world where a venture capitalist believes there's a bigger opportunity. Not all venture capitalists are gonna push back and not let you take that transaction, but I don't think any of them are gonna be happy about it, and why would you wanna take that risk? And if you go to a particularly aggressive firm, they'll be more than happy to say no. In the old days, I think the number was 40% of founders did not survive as the CEOs of their companies after they raised venture. Because, and look, I've never, ever fired a founder. I have lost founders when other people have funded them and they've been moved out. In fact, I had two companies worth of $5 billion, um, Lending Club and Zenefits, and they both, both the founders got pushed out. It was a horrible, horrible thing and it crushed the value of the company and it was just tragic in my view. But, you know, when people lose faith, things happen. And so think about your own level of control and think about your own level of outcome. Okay, so now let's go past that. I'll go through this for a second and then I'm gonna open it up to questions. Um, You've decided that, and, and what you say to people is gonna be different sometimes than what's inside you. I did only once ever find out that an entrepreneur lied to me. Maybe others have, I've, as I said, I've funded 80 entrepreneurs. This one wrote a book, and he gave me about eight pages, all very nice, except made fun of my belt. But I used to wear all of these ribbon belts, I still do. Anyway, he did acknowledge, though, that the pitch they were using didn't work, so they just started lying. And I didn't catch that, and that bothered me a great deal. He also sold the company for way too little. I could tell you a whole story about how they managed to get the acquisition cost cut in half. Um, but, you know, figure out whether you're aligned. Figure out what's, here's the way I think about it. Everybody has something inside them they need to be. 
They have a person they want to become. They have something that means success. That may be measured by dollars. Dollars are a very common yardstick. They may be measured by impact on the world. They may be measured by you know, lives touched. I just met an entrepreneur who wants to really spread wellness through the world, and he's going to use food to do it. Everybody has a different version of what success means. You've got to understand what it means to you, and you've got to make sure the people that fund you have the same version. Because if they don't, you're just setting yourself up for all kinds of trauma that you don't need. And I know how hard it is for entrepreneurs. To get an entrepreneur not to take money is like getting a horse not to eat oats. Apparently a horse will eat, horse will eat oats until it dies because it has no natural instinct to stop. And I've, I think once have I seen an entrepreneur actually stop when they had enough money. They wanted to raise a certain amount. They had an offer for three times as much. They said, no, we're just going to take this amount once. I've been doing this for 12 years, once. So I know it's really, really, really hard. But you know, what matters is that you actually can get to the goal you want to get to. The valuation doesn't even matter. The only valuation matters is the last one. How much do you get paid and how much do you own at the end of this journey? And maybe that's not even a, a, an end point. Maybe it's the IPO where you're going to run that company for another 10 or 20 years. As a shorthand for this, is before I open it up for questions, I think for a tier one venture firm, you should believe that you have the ability to become a public company before you go seek venture capital. I know there are other VCs, including on my own firm, that will be happy to take smaller outcomes. I think there are people that think a $500 million outcome is adequate because that would return, say, remember, a, a VC firm is typically going to own 20 to 30% of your company. A $500 million outcome, which sounds tremendous, is $100 million back to that fund. Go back to my math. We've got a $3.3 billion fund. I return $100 million. There's $3.2 billion to go before I see a penny of carry. And here's the amazing thing about NEA. Funded 1,000 companies in the last 40 years. 22.5%, 225 of those became public companies. That means if I only get a quarter of my companies public, all I am is average. You really think I want to be average? I mean, I took my company public when I was 33. I'm really proud of that. You think I want to be a mediocre VC and just average and sitting there in the middle? So I need to do better. I need to do better than one out of four of my companies get public. And I'm going to be wrong. So I do think the right bar is that that is not just a goal, but it's something you need. You need that sort of company. You need that sort of outcome. And if you look at the public markets and what it takes to become a public company these days, it's a really high bar. A lot of growth, a lot of margin, a lot of revenue. Profits seem to be a, a maybe. So that's some shorthand and some long stories. Tell me what questions there might be. If people don't ask, I can yap forever. Talk JS. I think you have to push the button on the top. No? Hello? Hey. Oh. Nice. Yeah, so um, I have two questions which are related. Uh, one is, I felt that most of your story applies to VC in general, not particularly US VC, so I'm wondering how that's different. And then uh, 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 next question is kind of related to what I suspect might be your answer. Is there, is there anything between VC and basically a bank loan? What if you are those... Uh, founders from that niche social network, you okay. want an investment, what other place could you go to if that VC doesn't match? Good question. So is it just US VC as I'm talking about? Yes. So the short answer to the first one is, I'm actually not even just talking about US VCs, I'm talking about what I would term a tier one US VC. Top 10 firms. 450 million to 3.3 billion dollar size firms. Um, the smaller ones at 450, 500 million dollars, by the way, have disproportionately larger goals. Like, they're, they really want to, these, actually one of them that's 400 million that does a really great job uh, is the one that told me, you know, if it's not 1,000x, I don't care. So, it is a certain tier. Now, one of the reasons I led in with the importance of fund size is let's say that in the perfect world for you, you grow a business which you think has a fair market value at the end of this rainbow of $250 million. Well, then think about fund size, something in the 100 to $200 million fund size, your outcome would be material. Because if they own 20 to 30%, let's use 25 to make it easy, and you sell for $200 million, that's $50 million. To a $100 million fund, that means a lot. To a $250 million fund, that means a material amount. So, you know, it isn't that nobody, that, that Pobody's nerfed. It's not every firm, but I'm, so I'm explicitly talking about, remember my journey was 15 of the top 15 firms and these 300 people? That's the lens I've spent time looking through. The reason I spend a lot of time on the beginning on that is just, I can only show you what I learned. I moved to the Bay, I wanted to learn all this stuff, but I learned it through a very specific lens. European funds are different, you know, there's, there's subgroups of funds all over the world, everyone acts differently. So this is all about 
are you ready for US venture capital? But you should probably say, are you ready for tier one US venture capital, the biggest and the best? Um, the second question, what's in between a bank loan and VC? By the way, if an entrepreneur can get a bank loan, <laughs> more power to you. I always said I would never talk to a bank and one finally convinced me to and I just ended up wasting weeks of doing work that materialized in nothing. They said, we can give you receivables line, uh, we, but, but we just need some collateral. Uh, why don't you pledge 100% of your assets, all your receivables, and a house? I was like, no. Um, one of the great things about Silicon Valley, I don't know if it's like that here, is that if you raise venture capital, the venture debt community will give you capital without that sort of security. They won't even require personal guarantees. It's one of the reasons why the, the Silicon Valley ecosystem is so awesome. In New York, if you want to raise debt of any sort from anybody, you're signing a personal guarantee. I, Ben Narison, say that if I don't pay this as a company, I will pay it personally or you can bankrupt me. In Silicon Valley, no one would touch that. Everybody just funds the business and its excitement. In between, though, you've got, I mean, the world of fundraising has changed so much. You've got AngelList, which has a whole lot of funky types of, of capital. You've got sort of syndicated angel structures through, there's GoFundMe. There's all kinds of crowdfunding mechanisms. I don't have a lot of excitement for things like ICOs, but certainly that's provided a lot of capital for folks. Um, there's angels of various flavors. You know, angels go all the way from angels to super angels to sort of, I'm retired and I really want to do something other than just invest, so I want to give money and time. And then you've got like shark tank types of people that'll loan you money, but they want a lot back. And so there's lots and lots and lots of forms of capital. Uh, the game of being an entrepreneur is not that different than the game of being a VC in the following way. Both of our jobs are exactly the same. We spend all day every day when it comes to either you raising money or me trying to find people to give money to, kissing frogs. We just kiss frog after frog after frog, and we, every day we wake up hoping one of those frogs turns into a prince or a princess. So when it comes to money that's in between, you just have even more frogs to kiss. And you hope that you will find that frog that matches your needs. The one that when you say, I want to build a business that grows from a million dollars to $5 million in revenue and gets bought for $25 million because I think that's realistic, they're excited about that. But you just got, asking the questions is a useful thing to do. Others? Brave souls? Ma'am? Uh, why should we be talking with US venture capitals rather than European? And also, how early should, after seed funding, should we be starting the dialogue? Great question. Um, it's not clear that you should be. I think that the time to talk to US venture comes in in a couple of different instances. One, you want to expand in the United States and you believe that that expertise and on the ground access will be valuable to you. Two, you believe that having US venture adds something. You know, I've often found that, so I'll give you a different example. Silicon Valley venture capital is different than New York venture capital or Boston. And I used to have a lot of companies I would fund in New York that would aspire to raise Silicon Valley venture capital because they thought it would change the way they were perceived and the way they thought about the world. I think both of those things are somewhat true. There is a very go big or go home mentality. I mean, it is sort of, there's a, a lot of great stories, but you know, you don't build Google-like businesses without being able to say no to a lot of very lucrative offers. And so when someone has a desire to build an outsized company of a certain level, I think having a board member that will push for exactly that, that will be their ally. You know, I've been in situations where I wanted to be a board member as a seed investor, it happened twice, and could not in either case because I wasn't the lead investor, where later those companies had outcomes different than I expected. And the reason I wanted to be a board member was I know that I was very aligned with my entrepreneur's desire to build something huge. But some of our investors, one of whom was not from the United States, but also wasn't from Europe, let's just call it another country, um, didn't have the same mindset. And I'm not saying they were wrong, but they had small funds and they had smaller visions. And eventually that entrepreneur was pretty much forced to sell. They had a good outcome. I think they sold for north of $300 million, less than $500 million, like 30x return. But I'll tell you that I'm still bitter about it because that entrepreneur wanted to build something bigger. I believed he had an opportunity to and his board was too weak to support him in doing so. So he would have benefited from a classic ultra alpha, unfortunately, Silicon Valley VC as long as that was his goal as well. And it goes back to the match. Um, and sorry, the second part of the question was? How soon? How soon? You know, I think that one of the things about there's a, a friend of mine, Mike Maples, moved from Austin, Texas to Silicon Valley. 
He was a successful entrepreneur, took his company public, and then wanted to be an early stage investor. And he tried to do it in Austin. And then later he said, you know what, I realized I just go where, the, where it all happens. Sort of the attitude is if you want to be a Shakespearean actor, you're probably going to spend a lot of time in London. But if you want to be a Broadway actor, you want to spend time in New York on Broadway, not in Chicago. You probably do Chicago for as long as you have to, but you really want to get to Broadway. And there's just so much going on there. And I bring this up because there's such a wealth of talent, and it comes from all over the world. Silicon Valley has been a huge magnet. I'm saying everybody should move to Silicon Valley. It just happens that a lot of people visit. And I bring that up because the bar goes up the farther you have to go. So it took me roughly 24 hours to get here. I got on a plane at 6.55 p.m. and I got into my hotel at 6 p.m. So net, net, I lost a day in each direction. So if I'm gonna be on the board of a company, you know, if my bar is here for a company I can take a 45 minute drive or train ride into San Francisco to be on the board of, it's gonna be here for a European company because it's gonna cost me a lot more in terms of time and access, plus I don't have the network to help as much as I'd like. If you say to me, I'm getting ready for my IPO, can you get me a great CFO? Well, if I'm in San Francisco or New York, I've got a list of people. If you're in Berlin, I've got zero. So, you know, I know there's gonna be more risk to me because I don't have the network to help as much or to be close by. You say, oh my God, I got a huge problem, I need your help. Great, I'll be there in 24 hours isn't as good as I'll be there in 45 minutes. So I think that means later, is generally better. You can raise post seed, but the momentum that you created is super important. You know, both Atomico and the last speaker sort of put up the J curve charts. And, you know, everybody, and yes, I, one of the best charts up there, by the way, was the one that went like this, because everybody talks about this, and this never happens. It's always this bouncy chart, but ultimately, you know, you want to find the points in that chart that are going up. So, someone had asked me this uh, earlier for me. I, I think that Series B is more likely for a firm like NEA than Series A. I think that's when we did Go Euro, which is a Berlin-based company. But I think it becomes more of, you can always take more risk in a company closer to home, here you're gonna need more proof. Like, show me the money, show me that it's working. Because betting on the maybe is a lot harder when I can't even be around to influence it at all. Others, you wanna continue on? I don't think so. The question was, if you just raise seeds, you start the conversation with VCs now. Uh, I have a very specific view on this. When my entrepreneurs came to me and said, okay, we just raised our seeds, should we start to get to know people? My answer was always, no, that is a waste of your time. However, the reason I said that was, when you are ready, if you are ready, I will get you to those people. So as long as you have a surrogate that can get you to them. But remember that you only have one chance for a first impression. So no matter when you meet a VC, and no matter what they say, coffee, get together, connect for a minute, me included, they're always thinking, is now the time, is now the time, is now the time, is this the frog that converts? And if now is not the time, good luck getting another meeting until six months from now. Because whatever you said you were gonna do, hopefully you're gonna do, but that didn't get them there anyway. So, you know, it's like I have a similar view of people say, oh, can I put you on my update list? No. What's the point? I am currently 426 emails behind. When you send me an update the first time, I might read it. The second time, I probably won't, and the third time, I'd go ahead and put you into spam. So wait until you have something material. Save those precious contacts until you have something that's gonna make me say, wow. You know, I'm only talking about the way I think about the world, but I figured out long ago that what I do all day long in my frog kissing adventure is look for an entrepreneur that makes me say, wow. And so if it's an idea that makes me say, wow, that's great as a seed investor, but as a VC doing A's and B's, now show me that traction. And so, you know, you did your seed and your seed's gonna get you to point X, get to point X or beyond and then start, you know, look, the exciting businesses get people's attention. And there's usually someone that can help you get to them through, for a warm intro. But, you know, I read unsolicited emails. I will mention, <laughs> I read them, doesn't mean I'm gonna reply to them. You're sending me an email I didn't ask for, doesn't mean I am obligated to be polite and reply to them. It just means I'm gonna read the, and by the way, I'll read the first line and the second. I'll read the headline, so long emails, always your enemy. Like elevator pitch, elevator pitch. I did make the mistake of saying to somebody, okay, everybody here send me your elevator pitch one line in the subject header, and they did, except for this one entrepreneur who literally sent me 12 emails with everything in the subject line. <laughs> like, how about this, how about that, how about this, how about that, I finally gave her 20 minutes. It did, in not the right way. Like, persistent, but not irritating. That's a tricky balance, I'm not sure I'm good at it. Okay, I see another question back there. I'll wait for the, the team will shut me down when they need to. What do your successful founders have in common, the ones that you spend Christmas with, and how, how hard do they work and how do they make their teams work hard? I know it's a big question, sorry. Yeah, no, I think there's only one secret to entrepreneurial success and that is tenacity. And all my founders that have done well have it. 
Um, it took me three years as a seed investor before one of my companies failed. And that was always very confusing to me because I was investing in PowerPoint slides. And so part of me was proud and another part of me thought I must have left a lot of money on the table because zero failures in three years backing PowerPoint? I mean, these people need to be failing. I'm not taking enough risk. And then a friend of mine said to me, yeah, I get that. You just invest in people like you. It's like, what does that mean? They don't look anything like me. They don't act anything like me. They're usually engineers. You know, they're all kinds of colors and spectrum and genders and everything else. And no, you give, a, you give money to people that refuse to die. The unwillingness to lose, or that's not fair. We all will lose in different places in our lives. The unwillingness to give up. The lack of any concept that you can fail, that there is any wall you can't run through, is the strongest asset you can have as an entrepreneur. To get funded at all is going to take wicked intelligence, a great, I say I need five things, people, 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 a great idea, and a huge market if it works. I can't bet just on people anymore. It just hasn't worked for me. I also need to love the idea, and I love to have a market that can be huge. But when you have all those things and you don't have tenacity, it doesn't matter, because someone else is going to outwork you. And if they're willing to put that into their lives, that's why I'm willing to take that meeting Christmas Eve Eve and Christmas Eve night and all of that stuff, because you know, they're giving up their whole lives for this. The concept of work-life balance as a young entrepreneur is a myth. I mean, I don't know, we used to say you can sleep when you're dead. There's just no time. An entrepreneur said to me, wow, I was really surprised I had a 14-hour trip back from India. I slept the whole way and I got a whole night's sleep. I'm like, because you're massively sleep deprived, because your life stinks in that way, right? And to, if that doesn't fuel you, that's quite challenging. So I think tenacity is the, the number one above all else. How do they get their teams to work that hard? I think that you lead by example is the only way. I went to um, an all hands, one of my companies, and they have a hot topics thing where any employee can ask a question, it'll get reviewed. And at least three or four of them were about work-life balance. And the answer was sort of like, yeah, good luck with that. You know, like, look at me, I'm, I'm working all, this is a founder. You know, you as a founder, if you're not working nights and weekends, it's gonna be hard to crack the whip and convince your people that they should do that too. And I'm not saying that nobody should have work-life balance. That's not my point. It's just incredibly difficult as a young entrepreneur to have that. The kind of energy and, and just dedication it takes. You know, there's um, a great story about how in China, people were recruiting, I forget what the saying was, that instead of 10 by seven, it was 10 by six. Meaning instead of having a job that required you for 10 hours a day, seven days a week, you could take this other job that's only 10 hours a day, six days a week. And that was a huge benefit. I mean, that's a work ethic we're up against every day in a lot of businesses. So, you know, you lead by example, you do the hard work, others see that, they've got to buy into the vision. That's also why someone made the point of having a Northern Star set of metrics. I just think the most important thing an entrepreneur can have outside their own abilities and their tenacity and focus. Focus is hugely important. Having a Northern Star you can point to, that you can lead against. Like your troops are marching on, you know, it's like, this isn't a marathon getting from zero to success in entrepreneurship. This is an ultra marathon built as a hurdles race. So you've got a hundred mile marathon through the desert and every mile or two people throw massive hurdles in front of you you have to jump over. And if you don't jump over them you have to stop and you're done, right? To get your troops to march through that journey, I know that's a mixture of bad metaphors, you know, they've got to know what they're marching towards. There's nothing more powerful than being able to say, that is what we're trying to achieve, that thing right there. Because when you have unity of vision, the bigger your company gets, the more chance they can align towards that. And when they see how you perform, every company has a different culture. I know some very, 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 very small number of companies that create happiness at a certain size, but in, in smaller early days, it's just pain. Uplifting, no, let's find a better question to end on than the one that ends in, it's all pain. One more, one more happy question about the wonders of entrepreneurship. If not, okay, there's one right there in the, nope, that was a handshake. Okay, I thought it was a question. Yeah, percentage of female founders. I think in my seed portfolio, it was up to about 20% which I understand to be better than average, but it needs to be better than that. Um, NEA's got a very active focus there. We actually just got our first female general partner. We hired a new regular partner two years ago that's leading our femtech effort, interesting, her own decision. Uh, Vanessa's awesome, and she was working a lot of categories, and what she realized was it's great to have deep domain expertise in one area, and so femtech is one that she's really explored and, and gotten quite cogent in. So I, there's a lot more opportunity now because like just look around this room, it is, actually I probably funded more as a percentage of female founders than this room represents. 
there's more women coming into the market than there have been in the past, which helps to get more funded. I do fundamentally believe, at least in Silicon Valley, it's an almost absolute meritocracy. I hope one day to be able to fund a bi-gender purple octopus, because then I can say, look, you see, it doesn't matter what you are, it matters that you are ridiculously smart, have a great idea, are incredibly tenacious, and can drive to success, and want to build me a multi-billion dollar public company. And if a Martian octopus can do that, I'll be so excited, because there'll never be a question of it being a meritocracy or not. So there's, there's great founders of every flavor, and you know, I, I think that, that no flavor allows you not to have those assets. Those assets are as required there as they are, you know, no matter what. So um, that will be good. Let's one more, and then. So the question is, can U.S. companies allow themselves in times of sanctions to invest in Russian startups? It's interesting. I went to Moscow for the opening of Sokobo and did a keynote there and um, ended up coming really close to funding a company out of Moscow at the time. The engineering, the technical talent in Moscow is, or in Russia in general is quite good because it's a deep, deep, deep history. In fact, my own US-based company, almost all our engineers were Russian born but living in Brighton Beach outside of New York. Um, the sanctions stuff though, you know, there's ultimately what most VCs do in many companies they fund, regardless of where they are in the world, will fund into the Delaware C Corp that's created to be a, to wholly own the other assets, but I'm getting way beyond my depth here because it's a question for legal at that moment in time. With the right opportunity, it pretty much doesn't matter where you are, but no VC is ever going to violate the laws of our country just to get into an opportunity. Like we have, there's sin clauses. We don't fund alcohol. We don't fund tobacco. We don't fund gambling. You know, there's and and also NEA. If there was a sign on the wall, which there are not, think about this: 225 IPOs, and there's not a single. IPO board on our wall. I'll tell you, if I was sitting there running that place, and I love the guy that runs the place, it's a phenomenal group, you'd have 225 tombstones. Like, oh, welcome to our firm. Did you see that we've done all of this? This is more than any venture company has ever done ever, just so you know. Um, but having said that, the one sign that would be on the wall at NEA, do the right thing. And so you'll never compromise, at least we will never compromise, doing the right thing. I think there are plenty of ways to do that. I think a lot of those companies do end up finding another home, maybe because of access to capital. There's also what kinds of stuff going on now with sort of how you can, a, a different angle, like how people can take Chinese money, et cetera. Did you need me to stop, or you had one more? You need me to stop. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for having me. I'm around if you want to talk to me.